Bruce Marcus is a Boston area storyteller, poet, and sometimes songwriter. He started out on paper, as he indicates, writing in grade school. Went, took off in college and beyond, and after college he picked up a guitar and started playing songs and became very interested in the 80s and 90s folk music scene and going to open mics. And for a while, he thought that was what he wanted as his primary creative outlet until he discovered storytelling. And when he did, he discovered his passion for creating all kinds of stories, nonfiction, life stories, fiction, rhyming stories, song-like stories, and otherwise, never feeling confined to any different form. And apparently in the storytelling world, that is okay. In fact, it is quite okay <coughs> as Bruce uh, is highly respected in the storytelling community. He has been a Mass Mouth Story Slam finalist and semi-finalist. In 2013, he won the Story Slam at Sharing the Fire, the Northeast Storytelling Conference. He is feature coordinator and one of the hosts of Story Space, a wonderful uh, venue for sharing stories in Cambridge at an art gallery that is weekly. And that was started by the late storytelling legend Brother Blue and his wife, Ruth Edmonds Hill. And they just celebrated their 23rd anniversary. Bruce has also worked with the organization of Mass Mouth, helping to host and produce story slams around greater Boston. And he also serves as treasurer and one of the directors of the Jewish Storytelling Coalition. And to invite Bruce up, I will end with a quote that the late great brother Blue used to call Bruce his son, loudly, publicly, emphatically, and often. Bruce said he found this honor pretty cool, if a bit perplexing, <laughs> and he hopes to one day, in some small measure, at least even momentarily, live up to such high praise. And I look forward to hearing some of what Bruce Marcus will offer, and I am sure we will feel Brother Blue smiling uh, in the room today. So please give a hand for Bruce Marcus. Yeah, I thought we were going to do light and darkness, and today's a perfect example. We've got the darkness of the sky and the lightness of that white stuff that we've come to know oh so well this year. And I thought, what better topic for light and dark than parenting? <laughs> So I thought I'd share with you two stories this morning, one about each of my kids. First, my son. In the fall of 2002, my wife and I traveled to Russia, and we brought back a couple of souvenirs. Actually, a whole suitcase full, but two in particular that we absolutely could not transport, transport via suitcase without raising some serious eyebrows at customs were an infant girl, almost one, and a boy who was nearly three. Before traveling to Russia, one of many, many things that kept me awake at night, staring at the bedroom ceiling, was the thought that we were about to become parents of this little toddler guy who spoke only Russian while we spoke virtually none, and that for some unknowable amount of time there was going to be pretty much no basis for communication. Well, we traveled to Russia met our children for the first time. And let me tell you, meeting your kids who are already growing for the first time in a foreign orphanage is one of the more surreal experiences that life can hand you. Well, we visited them there in the orphanage for a week and a half. And during that time, everything that we said and read to the little toddler guy was translated for us from English into Russian. At the end of the week and a half, the Russian authorities said we could take the children out of the orphanage and keep them. So we brought them back to the hotel where we were staying. Well, when my new son walked into our hotel room, he was Alice in Wonderland. He walked around the room touching absolutely everything, running his hands over the bed and, ooh, the TV screen. Twelve and a half years later, he hasn't changed much in that regard. <laughs> He opened and closed every single drawer in the room multiple times, played with the telephone on the bedstand. No long distance toll calls there, young man, please. Well, when he started to show interest in the bedside lamp, I sensed a teaching moment. I went over beside the lamp and flipped up the wall switch, and the bedside lamp blinked to life. 
Light on, I told him. I flipped the switch down, the light went dark. Light off, I said. I repeated the exercise. Switch up, light on, down, light off. Well, my son, delighted, seized the switch and began flipping it up and down and up and down while I tried my best to keep up. Light on, light off, light on, light off, light on, light off, <laughs> until I was afraid he was going to wear the switch and me out. During the few days that we were staying there in that hotel room, a fairly encouraging thing happened. One afternoon, I handed my son a balled up piece of paper and I said, will you throw this away for me? There's a basket in the wastebat, in the, um, a wastebasket in the bathroom. And he took the piece of paper from me, trundled across the room and into the bathroom. Well, I crept over to the bathroom doorway, peered inside and watched as he crossed the white tile floor and sure enough, threw that crumpled piece of paper into the basket. And I remember thinking, maybe this isn't going to be quite as difficult as I feared after all. Well, we traveled back home, brand new family of four. And after we arrived, we had our kids evaluated right away for their, um, by an international adoption medical specialist. They were found to be basically healthy. And shortly after that, my son turned three, and at that time he was evaluated for his cognitive development. Now the test had to be administered in Russian. And he was found to have some residual delays thought to be a result of his time spent in the orphanage and not anything intrinsically wrong with him. And so our goal at this point became to have him caught up to his peers by the time he was five years old and ready to enter kindergarten. Time was on our side, but we had our work cut out for us. In the meantime, he was beginning to speak some English, generally two word sentences usually where the first word was want, as in, want crackers, want juice, want cookies. Well, one day I was showing him our photo album from my wedding. In this album were photographs that were taken by the people who'd come to the wedding with whatever cameras they had brought, or the disposable film cameras that we left out on all the tables. You remember those? Well, we were flipping through, and there was page after page of groupings of <coughs> colored photos. Oh, I, I mentioned actually there was only uh, one professional photographer at the wedding, but he was an invited guest. My wife's cousin Brad, known for his work in black and white. So we're flipping through and there's all these clusters of different colored photos. When, when we come to upon one of cousin Brad's, this artful 8x10 that has a page all to itself, well my son pointed excitedly at this photograph, the first black and white that he'd seen, and summoning all the descriptive power of his limited English, knowingly squeaked, light off. <laughs> <laughs> Language acquisition came pretty quickly after that. When he was four, he was evaluated again, this time in English. And he was found to be solid to age five for receptive language and solid to age six for expressive. By the time he was five and entering kindergarten, he was pretty well caught up. But the day that I knew my son was a fluent English-speaking, English-thinking boy, he was five years old and sitting on our living room sofa beside my daughter watching television, PBS Kids, during a fundraiser. Somewhere in between Sesame Street and Curious George, this woman came on the television and said, hello, my name is so-and-so, and PBS Kids is marvelous programming for children. It's educational as well as entertaining, and blah, 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 yada, yada, on and on she went for minutes, putting up what had to have sounded to my small children like this impenetrable wall of adult speak, until it finally reached the point where my five-year-old son turns to his three-year-old sister, points to the woman on the screen, and says, you can't understand her. She's speaking Spanish. <laughs> That's a little story about my son. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm going to tell you a story about my other kid now in uh, just over two minutes. But in the meantime, I want to offer up a little poem in between as kind of a palate cleanser. This is also on the topic of parenting. It's a, a tender slice of family life entitled, Daddy Used the F Word. <laughs> now that I've elicited a laugh, I'll move on to the story about my daughter. No, I'll tell you the poem. Daddy used the F word. Daddy used the F word. I can't believe my ears. Daddy used the F word, though he claims he never swears. 
He's never been that kind of guy. I think I'll laugh or maybe cry. I wonder, will God make him die since Daddy used the F word? I know I heard correctly, too. He said it very clearly. In fact, he shouted it quite loud as though he meant it dearly. I think he thought he was alone or just forgot to think, sprawled out in the kitchen with his head beneath the sink. You've been there before, huh? Yeah. <laughs> While fixing pipes, his wrench did slip. It spun around. He lost his grip. It hit his face and split his lip. And Daddy used the F word. <laughs> Sometimes, out in public, he knows us kids have heard people use what Daddy likes to call four-letter words. He says don't repeat them, though, that those terms just confer a weak vocabulary and a weaker character. <laughs> Which, of course, is why his loud outcry made me stop and blink as it burst upon the household from beneath the kitchen sink. And he will not apologize. My mom, I must alert, as he sits up and blood runs down his chin and undershirt. He says he's our example. I'd say this time, he blew it. <laughs> Daddy used the F word. Wow, who knew he even knew it? <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, well, now to give equal time to my other kid. This is a story that I call Backwards Day. <laughs> Daddy, it's Backwards Day. This for my daughter Sunny in the back seat of the minivan. Backwards day means she now wants us to engage in a conversation where we say the opposite of what we mean. It's yucky out when it's a gorgeous day, or it's beautiful out when it's 35 degrees and sleeting like today. To her, it's a game, a fun exercise. For me, it's recreational too, but in a different sort of way. You see, I see it as a silver platter opportunity to mess with her eight-year-old mind. <laughs> oh, I say, so it's not backwards day? No, she says, it is. Well, if it's backwards day, I say, saying that it's backwards day means that it isn't. <laughs> OK, then, she says, it's not backwards day. I say that means that it is. <laughs> Unless, of course, it really isn't backwards day, in which case saying that it isn't means just that, that it isn't. Well, silence for a few moments from the back seat, and then, my articulate, clever daughter says, I hate you. <laughs> well, I laughed too, coming as it did from a good-natured kid. You know, had it been blurted out by an angry adolescent or teen, I might have felt a little bit differently about it. Well, later that evening, much later, Sunny was long since asleep. My wife was home and able to hold down the fort. So I decided to take a walk in the neighborhood. You know, one of those late night walks where you put your life, your day, the universe, everything into perspective. I was walking along the sidewalk, checking out my neighbor's front gardens, at least as much as I was able to see between the occasional, beneath the occasional street lamp. When all at once it occurred to me that Sunny's proclamation in the van may have simply been backwards speak. Well, it certainly was an appealing interpretation and one that hadn't occurred to me right away. Maybe some of you took it that way when I said it. Maybe you're more clever than I am. But I was there when she said it, and you know, it really wasn't all that obvious. And I began to wonder, how did she mean it? How did she mean it? And then, all at once, I felt like a character in a movie, a particular character from a particular movie. I felt like the robber at the beginning of the movie Dirty Harry. Now here is a man who's just committed armed robbery in a busy, crowded downtown section of a major metropolitan city in broad daylight, right under the watchful eye of Maverick Inspector Harry Callahan, while Callahan was eating lunch at an open-air hot dog stand. A foot chase shootout ensues, the robber popping away over his shoulder with a small handgun, and Callahan booming after him with what can best be described as a pocket cannon. Finally, he corners the suspect. The two men are now standing several feet apart, out of breath, guns still drawn. 
It's a tense moment. Anything can happen. When Callahan, played by actor Clint Eastwood, finishes chewing and swallows the bite of hot dog that he's apparently had in his mouth this entire time, <laughs> and then delivers one of the most iconic lines in movie history. He says, now I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? Well, to tell you the truth in all that excitement, I kind of lost track myself. But being this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world, and would blow your head clean off, you have to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> the robber ponders the matter for a long minute and then surrenders. And as he's led away in handcuffs by two uniform officers who finally arrive on the scene, head down, arms behind his back, he stops in front of Callahan, looks up and says, hey, I, I got to know. So Harry Callahan, a.k.a. Dirty Harry, obliges him. Obliges him by pressing the barrel of his 44 man magnum up against the man's temple. And as the hapless robber, and each and every single person in the theater watching the movie gasps out loud, pulls the trigger. The gun lets off a loud click. And walking along through my neighborhood, at night, thinking about parenting, and trying on both counts not to step in anything unpleasant. <laughs> in the long, dark stretches between the all too few areas of illumination, I think, Sonny, how did you mean it when you said I hate you? I gots to know. <laughs> now what's at issue here is not whether or not my daughter loves me. I harbor no such insecurities. It's just simply that I, like probably most any parent here in the room, like to check in from time to time, gauge where my kid's head is at. And like the robber and Dirty Harry in his little conundrum, I endeavored to find out. But how, I wondered. I supposed I could ask, like he did, but huh, look where that strategy got him. And besides, just coming right out and asking, why that wouldn't be in the spirit of backwards day. I knew what I had to do. I mean, not specifically, but I knew the general approach I needed to take. My opportunity came a little bit sooner than I expected. Early the following evening, I was sitting in my home office paying some bills when Sunny exploded home from her afternoon gymnastics class, ricocheted through the house, burst into the room where I was working, and began peppering me with random details about her day like young kids will do when they haven't seen you for some number of hours. Well, I fired back a few pointed questions. And then, when there was a lull, I said, hey, Sonny, you remember last night in the van when you said I hate you? Well, I forgot to tell you, but I hate you, too. Well, Sonny's mouth fell open, just for a moment. And in that moment, her face took on this expression that I'd never seen before and couldn't quite read. Was it shock, amusement, some combination of the two? And then with this peculiar, almost sinister grin, she looked up at me and she said, you're stupid. <laughs> Talk about recoil. You know, when you have kids and you're engaged in this endless pursuit called parenting, sometimes there's this little voice inside your head that says, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. Sometimes. Other times, there's this other voice. <laughs> Parents, you know the one. It says, oh, I don't know if I would do that if I were you. Oh, wait a minute. I am you. <laughs> Oy. Well, right now, I was hearing both of those voices simultaneously, loud and clear. But I thought I chose this tactic, and I felt obligated to see it through to its conclusion. And so I drew a deep breath, grit my teeth like I'd seen Clint do in about 90% of his movies, looked at Sonny and said, you're stupid too, and ugly. And there it was, one of those things you must never tell your children, and it was out there, and I couldn't get it back. 
And I held my breath and I waited for the response. And my daughter said, without missing a beat, thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, no thank you. And with that, the clouds of doubt parted, <laughs> sunbeams broke through, and the angels of parenting began to sing. We hugged and kissed and told each other, oh, I hate you so very, very much. Whereupon Sonny skipped off happily to play in the other room while I resumed my paperwork, smiling and relieved. Backwards today, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's about as much as I have for you, but Cheryl, if you want me to fill the last three minutes up here, I suppose I can do that. Go for it. Please do. All right, I will. Um, Cheryl mentioned that I've, I've done some songwriting in the past, so this isn't actually what I was going to close with, but I can see the countdown monitor over here tells me I have three more minutes. So here goes. We've um, uh, had this endless record-breaking winter, and we've all survived it, so give yourselves a big hand for that. And I thought I would just share with you a very brief winter love song. And it goes like this. Mm. I said the trees are all bare, but I don't care. I'm in love. Mm. 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 I said my nose is frozen, I can't feel my toes. But I don't let that bother me, no. So what if the nights are all three weeks long and the temperature can't get above? Oh, 20 below, who cares, don't you know I'm in love? Mm, 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 mm. Well, there's ice and there's snow, but I don't mind. No, I'm in love. Mm. But I don't. Well, there's power lines down, and folks can't get around. Still, is L O V E for you and me. There's ice in the street, and there's nothing to eat. Still, I got plenty on which I can feast. It's at least 40 below without wind chill. My eyelids are all frozen shut. The snow's to my waist, but through it I race, cause I know that she's home waiting up. But I don't. She opens the door with a smile on her face, and she holds out a steaming teacup. Well, who cares if I'm hypothermic? Lord, I'm in love. Mm, mm, mm. Well, who cares? Not me, no, sir. Well, yes, re, I'm in love. Mm, mm, mm. Well, who cares? Who ha? Who me? Who we? Mm, I'm in love. Oh, yeah, yes, it, yeah. But I don't, but I don't, but I don't. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm sitting on the settee, but there's nothing on TV. And my iPhone won't connect, so there's no one I can call. I pick up my guitar and play a simple chord, then simply sit there staring at the wall. It's hard to write a song about first world problems. You end up sounding whiny, self-entitled like a jerk. I might be crouching in the dark while missiles miss their mark. But the toughest test I'm facing is the TiVo didn't work. I open the frigid air and wonder if there's something there. To ease that peckish interval between lunch and dinner time Although it's full of dishes, nothing satisfies my itches So I sit at the piano, but no verses come to mind It's hard to write a song about first world problems You always sound so petty, trying to work the referee I might have traded my last cent for a bowl of rice and lentil. Instead, I have to choose between the good and the breed. Ah, da, da, da. La, da, da, da. La, 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 da, da. In the morning rain, heading out to catch a train. 
to take me to the city working for a corporation the job is kind of boring I'd rather still be snoring I strum a little mandolin but get no inspiration it's hard to write a song about first world problems Put down on paper, they're trivial and trite. I might be sweltering every day, picking crops for meager pay. Instead, I'm here complaining about my sorry plight. La da 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 da, la da da da, la da 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 da, la da da. Thank you. Mama Sheep, embrace us gently, allowing perception to blossom, birthing tapestries, weaving color, sound, and smell. May all postponed wishes be realized. As shepherds of our dreams, let creations of the moment enhance our lives. Celebrate love. Help others. Promote friendships. Let us listen to the sea songs. Feel the wind moving hair to heaven. Welcome vibrations. Erupt in dances of celebration. Mama Sheep, Direct our minds to possibility. Help us surrender habits that perpetuate negativity. Construct beauty in our minds. Let divine inspiration flow like a river, blessing all. Happy New Year. <laughs>